Hey guys, I hope you're well. I just wanted to go over some research that I've been doing for a whiteboard video. I'm going to try to do it tomorrow. Um, if I've if I've got it figured out, I'll do it tomorrow. If not, I'll do it on Thursday. <clears throat> and you'll have to excuse me. I'm still dealing with kind of a sinus issue here. But uh, what I want to go over in this video is how the shadow banking system works. Snyder talks about this all the time, and I discussed it briefly. Well, maybe not briefly, but I, I discussed it with, uh, with Steve the other day, with Steve Van Meter. And it's, you know, these guys um, might have a little bit different takes on things here and there. Um, obviously, they understand it a lot better than I would say 99.99999% of uh, even the people on FinTwit or people who consider themselves to be economists or, um, you know, finance professionals. But there's some differences in opinions and, and the way it works or the, the outcome, the, the, the probabilities. But, you know, and even I was... Um, putting a little bit too much emphasis on the uh, bank reserves for the, uh, the the bank's lending capacity. And um, not that the system works the same way, but the lending capacity, I don't really think is like 0% of it is determined by uh, bank reserve, <laughs> maybe not 0%, but uh, well, let me show you guys what I'm talking about here. And to really thoroughly understand this, uh, we've got to go all the way back. And uh, so when I mean all the way back, I'm talking about the gold standard. And so let's review. And for those of you on the live stream right now, forewarned, uh, we're going to get into the nitty gritty here. And uh, I think a lot of this is going to kind of blow your mind and it's going to be a little complicated because I don't have a whiteboard. But if you combine this video with the whiteboard that I do either tomorrow or Thursday, you're going to increase your understanding of the global monetary system 10 times. And then I think the conclusion uh, that a lot of you will have is uh, kind of an aha moment as to why, or another reason, uh, they will, in my opinion, ban cash. And so anyway, let's go ahead and, uh, and do a screen share. Okay, so we start off with the gold standard. And this is from an article, looks like a 2014 article. Um, philosophicaleconomics.com, which I, I think is kind of like an MMT site. I'm not really sure. but And I, I don't know that I agree with, uh, with the entire uh, blog post, but it does give us some good diagrams just so we've got a, a basic understanding here. Okay. So the first way this, this works is you've just got the... Um, this is what happened when we had free banking, which which a lot of you know, I think, was the best form of banking we had. That was free of um, central planning, free of the government, free of a central bank, etc. So uh, people would take their gold coins and they would deposit them with, uh, in this case, bank one, two, or three. And in return, they would receive IOUs from the bank, um, bank notes if you will. And back prior to the Civil War, when we had free banking, uh, banks would issue their own notes. So, and uh, this article gives an example. You see these are actual $20 bill, $5 bill. Uh, and that, that, those are dollars, <laughs> but they're issued from different banks. It's kind of weird to see that uh, where we're obviously accustomed to seeing the greenback, everyone being identical and being a bank note from the Federal Reserve, the central bank. Uh, but that's 
the, the way it worked. Pretty simple. Uh, you give them the gold coins. Uh, that becomes an asset on their balance sheet. They give you the currency, the bank notes, which are basically I owe you this much gold. And then the people in the general public can trade these pieces of paper. A little easier to carry around than the, the gold coins. And then the banks say, oh, wow, people really don't redeem their gold coins daily. So we can go out ahead and if we get 100 uh, gold coins or $100 worth of gold, then we can go ahead and issue $1,000 worth of these banknotes and we can lend them out. We can make interest on them because very few people come and actually redeem their notes for the actual physical gold uh, that we have in the vaults. And there you get fractional reserve banking, uh, which, uh, as you guys know, I've stated many times, is uh, something that uh, the free market came up with. So then what happens is uh, in this part of the diagram or in this next diagram, th they are illustrating uh, what happens when there's a transfer from one bank to the uh, to another bank. So in this case, the person that had a $100 uh, in a quote-unquote checking account, uh, they would write a check. Uh, that would go to the individual that had an, an account with Bank 1, let's say. And so, therefore, Bank 1 has an additional $50 liability. They, the person who cashes this check, uh, let's just assume they keep it in, in an account, now this bank number one would have $150 worth of liabilities. Bank three would now have $50 fewer liabilities. But, of course, bank three would have to transfer uh, $50 worth of gold to bank number one. So then when the settlement was done, the transaction, bank one would have 150 in liabilities, 150 in gold coins when they started with 100 each. And then bank three would be down to 50 in gold coins and 50 in liabilities. And then they demonstrate what happens when you add fractional reserve to that. They use, for some reason, $18,000 in loans. I don't know why they kind of pulled that out of the hat. But <laughs> so bank three uh, creates $18,000 in loans. So they had $50 in gold, gold coins, if you recall. They had $50 in liabilities in this in a, in a checking account uh, that people could write checks off of. Now they've got, uh, they issue $9,000 in currency, and then they add $9,000 to this person's account, which is purchasing power. They're increasing the, 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 the broad money, if you will. And, uh, and then once... The same thing would happen is is if the the nine thousand was transferred over here again. I I think they use such a large number just to demonstrate the point because one of the things they're trying to argue, and this is you know kind of where I think I think they might get the diagrams right, but their conclusion I think is the complete opposite of mine. Uh, this is why they're arguing that we should have a central bank. Uh, if if you actually read the article, but anyway. Uh, so the 9,000, let's say, goes over to bank one, obviously. They can't transfer the assets, so you run into, or they can't tra transfer that many gold coins, uh, so you run into uh, a big problem there. Or if these people tried to, uh, you know, redeem uh, these people, the currency went out into the population and the people wanted to redeem nine thousand dollars of the gold coins uh that's not going to happen they're going to have a really big problem and that's it's kind of their argument as to why we need a central bank but that's how the system evolved now we move to a gold standard where we have a central bank in play this is the next diagram and it works uh, the same way except what happens is uh, actually i'll just go ahead and read this paragraph because i think they do a pretty good job of explaining this and i'll highlight it here and zoom in the system worked as followed private citizens would deposit their gold with private banks and received credit deposit accounts in exchange uh, that's what we talked about earlier 
and they're using the same numbers down here, except they're not using currency anymore. The, the private banks would then deposit the gold with the central bank. In exchange for the gold, the private banks would receive bank notes, in this case, Federal Reserve notes. Those are the dollars that we see today, greenbacks. As before, in lieu of receiving and holding the actual paper bank notes from the central bank, the banks could receive credits on their deposit accounts with the central bank. This is the kind of genesis of bank reserves. To keep things simple and intuitive from here forward, I'm going to, okay, so then he says he's going to use them, kind of lump them all together. So uh, this next part is important too. Instead of depositing gold with the private bank, citizens could also deposit their gold directly with the central bank and receive bank notes from the central bank in exchange. But the bank notes would eventually end up on deposit with private banks where people would store money or better said dollars. So the system would arrive at the same outcome. So, you know, thinking that through, if someone, uh, so they d give their gold to the bank, the bank gives it to the central bank. Now it's an asset of uh, the central bank. Uh, they issue currency to the individual banks that are liabilities of the central bank, the Fed in this case. And that's what they're trading. Now that's the asset that they're trading back and forth instead of in lieu of the, the coins. And that can be electronic, obviously. And then the people uh, get uh, one step removed, another step removed, I should say, in the sense that the banks just owe them uh, these dollars that they uh, really, uh, you know, uh, the paper dollars, uh, which they really don't have. It might be an electronic version, but the central bank is there to say, listen, um, you know, if however many dollars, physical paper dollars, uh, you need, you know, to handle the the people wanting to withdraw the actual physical dollars based on what you owe them. We'll go ahead and and, and print those up. Hence the term, uh, you know, money printing. But uh, what they note in that last paragraph is, if you took your gold directly to the central bank, they would give you, let's say, the hundred dollars uh, or a hundred IOUs, hundred banknotes, and then you would go and deposit the 100 banknotes with your bank, and then they would give you the credit, the IOU, $100, and then they would take that, and that would become part of their vault cash, or that would be an asset on their balance sheet. So what the author says is that it would, it would be the exact same thing, which is, is correct. So before we take it a step further and start to understand the modern system, and uh, the shadow banking system and the euro dollar system. We, we've got to we've got to understand this first. Uh, so uh, now, and, and this is the way most people see the banking system working today. They they see it as if they transfer a um, hundred dollars uh, to another bank. Like you, your your friend Bob has a bank account with Wells Fargo. You have a bank account with B of A. If they, tr most people see it as they're transferring. If they transfer a hundred dollars to Bob, then that they they give the bank they give banks uh, excuse me they give Bob's bank an asset because I'm giving the bank a hundred dollars. So then they see it like this, the way that we're describing here under the gold standard. As though those, it's like giving the bank paper dollars, giving them an asset, and then they take that asset, put it on their balance sheet, and then they give the person that you owed the $100 to an IOU for $100 or just increase the size of their checking account by 100 bucks. That's the way most people see it. And, and it's kind of the way it works, but what they really do is first and foremost, they don't transfer them uh, the dollars as an asset. They transfer the, the, the dollars as a liability, right? And then once they have that liability, then they're like, okay, well, now we need to transfer them an asset as well. So it, it it's kind of works out the same, but I think when people see it as though you're transferring a $100 uh, bill, you know, from one bank to the other, it, it gets a little confusing. So I don't want to go down that path and confuse you any more than you probably already are. But I think this, the way this system works, I think should make sense to, to most everyone. Okay, now let's continue to move on.
And uh, I want to give this gentleman credit. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult to find stuff online when uh, on these topics that you can trust. And um, this gentleman, Richard uh, Brown, uh, wrote this back in 2013. And so um, I don't even know really how to give him credit. I looked up his Twitter handle. It doesn't seem like he's on Twitter anymore, but uh, Jendal.me, I guess, is maybe his, his blog. But um, when I was scanning this article, he started using words where you can tell, okay, he at least knows, um, you know, he knows the verbiage that you should know if you know how the system works. <laughs> so once I started going and reading it further, I'm like, okay, this guy, for the most part, uh, knows what he's talking about to the extent that I think we can really learn and start connecting uh, a lot of the, the dots. So let, let's go through this here, understanding what we already know about how it worked under the gold standard. Uh, and 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 I'm going to actually read most of this and then kind of give you my uh, my commentary. But the first thing that I wanted to point out is that, and and this gentleman reiterates it, and I've said this a zillion times in in most of my videos. Uh, perhaps the most important thing we need to realize about bank deposits is that they are liabilities, and that that's that's what we need to understand that uh, they're, they're liabilities. When you pay money into a bank, you really you don't really have a deposit. There isn't a pot of money sitting anywhere with your name on it. Instead, you have lent that money to the bank. They owe it to you. So when they send that money to another bank, well, we'll get into that here. We'll get into that. It becomes one of their liabilities. That's why we say our accounts are credit. We have extended credit to the bank. Similarly, similarly if you are overdrawn and owe money to the bank, it becomes your liability, their asset. Um, so the first thing that they do is go over a transaction between two parties that actually are with the same bank. And this is a very, very simple transaction. And I've gone over this in a few of my videos when I'm trying to explain how the, or one of the ways, uh, the euro dollar system can just almost go to infinite numbers. Um, and because in this case, there are no, uh, you're only transferring liabilities from one account to the other at the same bank. Therefore, there's no transfer of assets. And so you don't have to have any assets to create more liabilities, <laughs> right? Uh, or in other words, more, more money, more dollars. Let's start by using an easy example. Imagine you're Alice, you bank with Barclays. You owe $10 or 10 pounds to a friend, Bob, who also uses Barclays. Paying Bob is easy. You tell the bank, what you want to do, they debit the funds from your account and credit the $10 to your friend's account. It's all done electronically on, on Barclays' core banking system, and it's rather simple. No money enters or leaves the bank. It's just updated on their accounting system. They owe you $10 less. They owe Bob $10 more. It all balances out, and it's all done inside the bank. We can say that transaction is settled on the books of your bank. We can represent this graphically below. And now this graphic, I don't think is very good. Uh, his other graphics are better. But so this could have been $10, but it also could have been $10 million. And the, my, my point, my earlier point, is that let's say that, uh, let's say you were Alice and you borrowed uh, $10 million from this same bank. Well, okay, now Alice would have $10 million in her account, uh, IOUs from the bank that they just created out of thin air. They're increasing the money supply. And the, the asset that would be created there, uh, because they're not getting an asset from another bank, the asset would be the loan itself. Because that loan is a liability of, of, uh, of Alice to the bank. It's a... Um, it's an asset on their balance sheet, they're the banks, uh, but then the dollars that have been created are actually uh, liabilities of the banking system, and now they're assets of Alice, but Alice, let's say she's using that $10 million to buy a business or something like that, uh, then she's going to go ahead and transfer that to Bob, 
let's say she's buying the business from Bob and he's at the same bank, then the same exact process would happen, right? They just transfer the 10 million from Alice's account to Bob's account, wham, bam, done. And the, and the only asset uh, that would, uh, that would um, be involved is the $10 million loan that was created by the bank extending credit uh, to Alice in the first place. Um, but they don't, but that bank wouldn't need to transfer any asset to another bank because there's no other banks involved. Very simple process. And, and you can, and so just if it's, so th why the Euro dollar system, one of the reasons why it can get so, uh, extensive, uh, without any, um, you know, real dollars in the system is because, you know, going back to our original example, remember the gold standard, if one person transferred um, money to another bank, then that bank would have to transfer gold coins or with the central bank, they'd have to transfer dollars or bank reserves or something like that. They'd have to transfer some sort of asset, right? And it could even be kind of off balance sheet in the shadows, which we'll get into here in a second, um, which, and that was kind of the, the conversation that I had with Snyder and with Steve to a certain extent, uh, but more so with uh, with Snyder the other day and our um, on our interview. But you see, uh, if if we're only dealing with one bank, though, then what's the difference between ten dollars, ten million dollars, or ten trillion dollars? Right? There's there's no difference. There's no assets that are needed. In, in other words, there's no assets that have to be transferred to another bank. So the, the balance sheet's like infinite to a certain, you know, theoretically. So here we go. And now it starts to get a little more complex. What happens if you need to pay somebody at a different bank? Uh, imagine you need to pay Charlie who banks with HSBC. Now we have a problem. It's easy for Barclays to reduce your balance by $10 but how do they persuade HSBC to increase Charlie's balance by $10? Because remember that $10 is a liability. Why would HSBC be interested in agreeing to owe Charlie more money than they did before? They're not a charity. The answer, of course, is that if we want HSBC to owe Charlie a little more, $10 more, they need to owe someone a little less or that or someone else needs to owe them a little more said another way who should this someone else be it can't be alice alice doesn't have a relationship with hsbc by the process of elimination the only other party is barclays and here's where we get our first aha moment what if hsbc held a bank account with barclays and barclays held an account with hsbc they could hold balances with each other and just adjust them to make everything work out. Now, he's using the word or the phrase bank account, but what he gets into later on, I think it would be much easier to understand. I don't think it's really a, a bank account, although they're, they're, we're dealing with liabilities and assets again. But I think it's just better to think of it as just a ledger system. And it, it's not really that HSBC has a bank account with Barclays and Bar Barclays has a bank account with HSBC. It's just simply that they've got a ledger system where they say, hey, I owe you this much. You owe me this much. If we agree, we agree. And that's what I talked about with Snyder. And, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be bank reserves. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into this further here in a moment. Here's what you could do. Barclays could reduce Alice's balance by $10. Barclays could then lend, excuse me, Barclays could then add $10 to the account HSBC holds with Barclays. Barclays could then send a message to HSBC telling them that they had increased their balance by $10 and would like them to in turn uh, to increase Charlie's balance by $10. So basically Barclays saying, hey, uh, you need to increase your liabilities by 10 bucks. And because you're doing that, we're going to give you 10 bucks or at least on the ledger system that we have between us, we owe you uh, an extra 10 bucks. So then the, uh, the Barclays 
uh, liabilities would decrease. But actually, their liabilities wouldn't even be the, uh, decrease. They'd just go from Alice to HSBC as far as the $10. And then the $10 would be an additional liability of HSBC because they've got to credit that to Charlie. Um, and then the asset would be the dollars uh, that Barclays says they owe HSBC that's on the balance or that's on the, the, the ghost ledger, if you will, uh, between the two banks. And as long as they agree on it, there does there really doesn't have to be any asset. It's not like a treasury goes back for it's not like mortgage backed security. It's not like even a bank reserve. It's just a ledger. And as long as they HSBC is cool with Barclays saying, Hey, we owe you an extra 10 bucks. And then it all works out at the end. As long as both banks agree on it, this is what, that's where it gets really bizarre, but we'll get into more of that here in just a moment. So it all balances out for Alice and Charlie. Alice has $10 less. Charlie has $10 more. And it all balances out for Barclays and HSBC. Previously, Barclays owed Alice $10. Now it owes $10 to HSBC. Exactly what I just was kind of talking about there. Previously, HSBC was flat. Now it owes uh, $10 to Charlie. And it owes ten. And it is owed $10 by Barclays. This model of payment processing is known as correspondent banking. Graphically, it looks like the image below. And now this is kind of where it is helpful. Um, so you've got basically Commercial Bank 1, Commercial Bank 2, and he's got Barclays, Deutsche, City, you know, Sockgen, uh, JP Morgan, uh, you know, throwing Wells Fargo, uh, City, whomever you, you, you bank with there if it's a big, big bank. And so they've got the commercial bank accounts, the retails. And in between them, now we start to see kind of what could be going on in what we'd call the shadow banking system or this uh, alternate, let's say, ghost ledger uh, that is really just kind of a wink, wink and a nod, nod between the two banks. And um, as long as they agree that, uh, you know, as long as commercial bank two that's receiving the liability thinks that commercial bank one is good for the IOU, then they're, they're good to go. Then we, we move on to see another day, but remember now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and then bounce back with the cash ban. Remember what, what are they giving each other IOUs for, whether it's the, um, Alice, Bob, Charlie, the commercial bank saying number one, saying that they owe the extra $10 to Commercial Bank 2 because they transferred them another liability. Well, they transferred them a liability for what? For dollars, right? And what are those dollars? What, what, what are those IOUs, that the actual bank accounts? They're a claim on paper dollars. They're a claim on something, right? That 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 is, and I know this is, not really the, the case, but to a certain extent is scarce. Now I know the, the bank can create it or the central bank can create as many as they want, but between these two banks, they can't create paper dollars. They can create electronic dollar liabilities all they want, but they can't really create paper dollars. But see what they're doing here is the bank accounts themselves that they owe their customers. Those are, are not that the people would ever uh, ask for the paper dollars, but they're a claim on paper dollars. You can, if you have a, you know, if Charlie has $10 in his account now, he can go down to commercial bank too, at least currently. <laughs> I don't know about the future, but currently he can go down and withdraw that $10. He can go to the ATM and get that $10 out. You see? So I wanted to plant that seed because I'm going to come back to that in, in, at the end of the video here. So the author goes on to state, this works pretty well, but it has some problems. Most obviously it works for the two banks that have a direct relationship with each other. But what if, what if they don't? Uh, you either can't make a payment or you need to route it through a third or fourth bank. Bank until you complete the path from A to B. This clearly drives up the cost complexity. 
some commentators restrict the use of term correspondent bank to the scenario of scenarios that involve difference uh, uh, involve different or difference. I think that's a typo there. Maybe different currencies, but I think it's helpful to use the term for simpler case. Yeah, I agree. But more worryingly, uh, it also is risky. This is what I talked about: counterparty risk. I'll look at the situation from HSBC's perspective. As a result of this payment, their exposure to Barclays has been increased. In other words, or in our example, is only by ten dollars. But imagine if it was one hundred fifty million, and the correspondent uh, wasn't Barclays, but a smaller, perhaps riskier outfit. I don't know that Barclays <laughs> is it. <laughs> okay, uh, HSBC would have a big problem on its hand if the bank went bust. One way, why? Because again, they're saying, hey, we're not transferring you any asset. We're just giving you another IOU that you can keep as an asset on your balance sheet on this ghost ledger. So everything balances out. You can keep that additional $150 million worth of uh, liabilities that we just transferred over to you. One way around this is an alter, uh, let's see, one way around this is to alter the model slightly. Rather than Barclays crediting HSBC's account, Barclays could ask HSBC to debit the account it maintains a Barclays. Again, this is just the same transaction, just kind of from another way. So they transfer the liability. And let's just say that, uh, you know, HSBC owed Barclays. Well, they could say, hey, HSBC, we're transferring you a $10 liability. So just uh, whatever we owe you, um, just decrease it by 10 bucks and we're good. You know, that, so instead of Barclays sending them the 10 bucks, they can just decrease the amount that they owe HSBC. That way, and now I'm going back to what he was saying here. That way, the larger interbank balances might not build up. However, there are no issues with that approach. However, there are other issues with that approach. Either way, the interco interconnectedness inherent to this model is a very real problem. We'll work through some of the scenarios. Hang on, why are you making it so com complicated? Why can't we just use uh, Swift and be done with it? Uh, and this is a good point. It's it's common uh, when discussing payment systems, uh, people say Swift handles this. He goes on to say that Swift ne network exists to allow banks securely to exchange electronic messages with each other. One of the message types supported by Swift network is MT103. MT103 message enables one bank to instruct another bank to credit the account of one of their customers, debiting the account held by the, sending uh, the institution with the receiving bank to balance everything out. Uh, you can imagine that, uh, let's see, debiting the account held by the sending institution. Yeah, so basically what they're doing is this transaction is debiting the ghost ledger and then, uh, or crediting the ghost ledger, and then doing the same thing on the liability balance sheet on the liability side of the balance sheet for each of the uh, of the the banks where the customers actually have uh, check or uh, deposit accounts. You could imagine an MT one hundred three being used to implement the scenario discussed in the previous section. Is what we talked about. So the effect of Swift MT one hundred three to send money uh, between the two banks. But it's critical, important to realize that what's going on under the covers of Swift message is merely the instruction. The movement of the funds is done by debiting and crediting several accounts at each institution. That's what we talked about. And relies on banks ma maintaining accounts with each other. The ghost ledger, I think is a better way to look at it. Either directly or through intermediary banks, simply waving one's hands and shouting Swift. Okay, so we understand there. So he says, okay, I get it. But what about H, excuse me, ACH? Euro one faster payments, BAC box, CHAPS, Fedwire. When you start hearing him talk about CHAPS and Fedwire, that's when my spidey senses go up and say, okay, this guy, he he gets the he gets something because he's 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 using the right terminology, especially if you watch the interview I had with Snyder. Uh, th this is where we start taking it into kind of the, the modern day and understanding how this thing works and why. Um, you know, although uh, w what I was doing focusing on bank reserves was um, uh, correct, what I wasn't doing, which was incorrect, as I wasn't paying enough attention to the to the we'll call it the ghost ledgers between the banks. And again, I'll, I'll we'll get into more of that here. So let's recap. We we've shown that the transferring money between two account holders at the same bank is trivial. 
We've also shown you can send money between account holders of different banks through a really clever trick arranged. The banks have accounts with each other. Again, just a, a ledger that they agree on. We've also discussed how electronic messaging networks like SWIFT can be used to manage the flow of information between banks to cover it quickly, reliable, modest cost. Uh, we still have to go further. A big problem is counterparty risk, liquidity, and cost. The two will tackle first liquidity and cost. First, we need to acknowledge SWIFT is not cheap. So here I'm going to kind of summarize. Basically, it's not cheap. It's uh, it, it's ve it's very cumbersome because you could imagine how many transactions may be going back and forth every single day between Barclays and HSBC. So if they're doing this for every transaction, it's it's just it's costly. It's cumbersome. Uh, so the solution is just to settle up at the end of the night. So and this is what he talks about right here. So what if we kept track of all the various payments during the day and only settled the balance and only settled the balance? Um, so you don't have to go back and forth with every transaction. You just kind of keep it on a ledger that isn't settling, but they're just kind of keeping score, if you will. And then at the end of the night, you just go ahead and and whatever is owed, you know, you could have, let's say, a billion dollars going of transactions going back and forth but the 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 net result could mean that uh barclays only owes hsbc a thousand dollars right so instead of all those billion you know billion dollars of the transactions they just kind of keep the score and at the end of the night it's just oh hsbc you owe barclay or barclays you owe hsbc a thousand bucks move the money over, done, settled, let's move on to the next day. It's only one transaction. So it saves the cost far more efficient by keeping that kind of score, if you will. If you adopted this approach, now I'm going back to reading, each, uh, each bank could get away with holding a whole lot a whole lot less cash, right? That's another thing too. What if, uh, you know, that $1 billion, you've got to transfer that back and forth and this, so you got to have a lot of cash on hand or a lot of liquidity on your balance sheet in order to to make that happen, where with that pr approach, instead of having to have a billion dollars of liquidity on your balance sheet, you'd only have to have a thousand bucks. Deposit the court. Let's see here, uh, the bank get away with holding a whole lot less cash on deposit at all time at the correspond. Now, again, uh, this kind of not that that the customers would have they'd have less customer deposits, but they would have less on deposit in the in ghost ledger between the two banks. That's what they're referring to. At all this correspondence, and they could put their money to work more effectively, uh, driving down the cost and hopefully passing on some of it to you. Okay. Uh, this is the process that motivated the creation of a deferred net settlement pay, uh, system. In the UK, I guess it's called BACS, B-A-C-S. Is such a system, the equivalent exists all over the world. In these systems, messages are not exchanged over SWIFT, Instead, messages or files are sent uh, to a central clearing system, which again is just kind of like a, a scoreboard, uh, which keeps track of all the payments and then on some schedule calculates the net amount owed to each uh, bank. Then they settle amongst themselves, perhaps by transferring money to form uh, accounts to hold with each other. Again, he keeps going back to this. I don't know why he's, it's not really holding a, I mean, I guess it is, It's just, but it's just a ledger system. Uh, this dramatically cuts down on the cost of liquidity demands. Okay, so now you, you look at Commercial Bank 1, Commercial Bank 2. We had the corresponding bank arrangement, which was kind of the uh, the ghost ledger. But now what we've got that makes this more expedient is this scoring system that keeps uh, track of what's going back and forth, uh, you know, minute by minute. And then at the end of the day, tallies everything up. So then they can just use that corresponding bank arrangement or the ghost ledger uh, just for one transaction instead of a thousand or whatever. It's worth noting that the uh, credit card schemes and even PayPal are deferred net settlement payment system or deferred net settlement systems. Uh, they're uh, categorized process of internal aggregation of transactions uh, with only the net amounts being owed to the major banks. Okay, got it. Um, so now he introduces another problem uh, that uh, that's settlement finality. So you might issue, you might issue your payment instructions in the morning, but the receiving bank doesn't receive the net funds until later. The receiving bank therefore has to wait until they receive the net settlement, just in case. Um, and again, they're talking about funds. It's not like they're sending paper dollars. They're just 
one bank is acknowledging the ghost ledger and it might it might be delayed or something that, that's really what we're talking about or the scoreboard might be delayed for some reason just in case sending bank uh goes bust in the interim uh yeah so basically what happens if lehman uh goes bust before the end of the day when you get to settle uh and it and the scoreboard says that lehman owes you a billion dollars you're screwed it would be imprudent to release the funds to the receiving customer before then and he gives an example uh let's see i'll turn Someone could be paid the final recipients could rely on the funds in a later case. Yeah, right. So I think you understand that. Uh, this final piece of the, of the jigsaw puzzle, he says, now the approach we've outlined so far is really acceptable for situations when you need to be absolutely sure the payments will be made quickly and they can't be reversed. Uh, even if there's a sending bank and the subsequently goes bust, you you still get your money. It's not an, it's not an IOU, the scoreboard. It's that it, it's been settled. But w without all the problems that we discussed before, you really need this assurance, for an example, if you're going to build security settlement systems, nobody's going to release $150 million of the bonds or shares if there's a chance the $150 million won't settle or would be reversed. Think about just uh, someone giving you a check and the check bounces, but they already have the goods or services. That's basically what he's talking about. Uh, what is needed is a system like the first one we outlined uh, because it's really quick but which banks work, uh, but which works when more than one bank is involved. Uh, the multilateral bank bank system outlined above sort of works, but gets really tricky when the amounts involved get big and when there's possibility uh, that one or the other could go bust. If only the banks could hold accounts with a bank that cannot itself go bust. Ta-da! <laughs> And now most of you, I'm sure, know exactly where we're going with it. And this is why I talked about how I made a mistake in not paying enough attention to the ghost ledger. But this is why I uh, correctly uh, would really focus on the Fed's balance sheet and the amount of bank reserves in the system or where those reserves are, are going and what that's telling us about uh, potentially where there's smoke, there may be fire, right? Uh, so he says, we could give this bank a name. It would be called a central bank. And this thought process motivates the idea of real-time gross settlement system. If the major banks in the, in the country all hold accounts with the central bank, they can move money between themselves simply by instructing the central bank to debit one account and credit the other. And that's what CHAPS, Fedwire, and Target 2 exist to do for the pound, dollar, and euro. So when I was talking to uh, uh, Snyder, about you know well, how are these banks outside the United States settling up if they don't have accounts with the Fed? Uh, first and foremost, he said a lot. You know, we talked about how a lot of them do through uh, intermediary banks, so that the Fed thinks they can control it. But again, you know, we go back to that ghost ledger, and what Snyder is saying is that yeah, we've got Chaps, we've got Fedwire, we've got Target too, but. Um, and the central banks like to think that the, that these account for, you know, the majority of transactions, but he's saying they don't. They they account for a very small amount, and the the the, the majority of the transactions going back and forth between banks are actually on the ghost ledger. But even Snyder was saying that uh, the amount of dollar transaction, and I think he said this in the interview. I could be wrong, but it, his point was that there's a lot of dollar transactions that go through chaps. Uh, and I think he mentioned a time frame where there are even more dollar transactions going through chaps than we're going through Fedwire. So in other words, um, the banks outside of the United States and banks just in the UK were transferring more dollars back and forth using the Bank of England then the banks in the United States were transferring back and forth using the Fed. And then the Target 2 system is for the, the euro, but I don't think uh, Snyder and I discussed that. Uh, respectively, they are the systems that allow real-time movements of funds between accounts held at the banks. Real-time, gross, no settling. Uh, it's gross, no netting. Otherwise, it could 
couldn't be instant uh, with finality, no reversal. So now what we've got is this uh, relationship between Commercial Bank 1 and Commercial Bank 2. We've got the ghost ledger, the corresponding banks, the kind of wink, wink, nod, nod between them. We have the deferred settlement, which is the scoreboard that allows them to settle just in, in one quick transaction at the end of the night. But then we have some of the transactions coming through uh, the central bank because it alleviates some of the problems uh, that arise, uh, i.e., you know, counterparty risk and whatnot. Um uh, so, but and it kind of defers that to the central banks because most of these uh, big commercial banks have a, accounts with the central banks where they can just transfer uh, bank reserves as the asset going from Wells Fargo, or in the case that the the, the author used from uh, Barclays to HSBC. So something that was done without the need of the the, the ghost ledger here or the scoreboard. So this, and again, my point is what, what the central banks like us to believe is that these transactions that are done using, let's say their scoreboard or their ledger system are the majority of transactions involving that currency. But what Snyder is saying is no, 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 no. <laughs> this is a very small percentage. This, the scoreboard, and the ghost ledger is where the majority of transactions are happening between the two banks themselves with a wink-wink and a nod-nod. And the central banks, not only do they not have any control over it, but they don't even understand the extent to which it exists. And that, and there, the green that I'm showing you here, that's the euro-dollar system at the end of the day. Uh, outside of the United States. And uh, so hopefully this is, uh, you know, and then he goes on to talk about uh, Bitcoin, and uh, which is very interesting, but I, I don't want to go down that because I, I want the focus to be here on, I don't want to get too scattered. Um, if you want to do that, I just look at the URL and go to it. So how does this, so let's think about this. Um, everything that the banks are doing again, is is an IOU for a, a piece of paper, right? Even, even this settlement system, at the end of the day, the ghost ledger, is where one bank is telling the other bank, hey, we owe you, but we owe you something that is redeemable with paper currency that only the central bank can create. Therefore, the, the bank themselves cannot create the paper currency. They can create an infinite amount of the electronic IOUs we we're referring to. But so my point here is if you've got the paper currency, it, although it's just so trivial and we never use it, but if it's if it's an IOU for the paper currency, then there is some sort of scarcity, or at least it's outside of the control of the commercial banking system. That's what kind of keeps them honest, if you think about it. Because if, if you ban cash and nothing is redeemable for anything that uh, none of these IOUs are redeemable for anything that is outside of the control of the commercial banks themselves. That's what I'm getting at. And if that was the system, then there would be nothing preventing the two commercial banks to have this system where they would quite literally be able to print their own money. Now, I know that sounds weird because they do create new money now, right? But they they don't necessarily, well, I guess they do with, with the, the IOUs back and forth on the ghost ledger. They're, they're creating, um, see, they're still creating dollar-based liabilities. And so my, my point here is for a thought experiment, let's say that commercial bank number two 
all of their loans went bust. All of them. So they're so they are they're they are bust, right? They're 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 negative equity. They're insolvent. So therefore, all of those IOUs where they owe bank one, bank one all of a sudden takes a big hit and now they don't want to do business with commercial bank number two because they know they're most likely not good for it because their whole loan book just blew up. But again, that goes back to the system where commercial bank two would actually owe them something that they didn't control. You see, if, if, if there isn't that to keep the system honest, then what's to prevent, even if their loan book completely blew up to where they were insolvent, so what? And so what? The, how, how would that change the scoreboard? How would that change the ghost ledger? You would say, oh, well, George, then they, they, they couldn't, uh, you know, they'd be far less likely or they wouldn't have the ability to pay their debt that the scoreboard is keeping track of. What do you mean they wouldn't have ability to pay it? There's nothing there to pay. All it is is electronic digits. So if, as long as Commercial Bank 1 just said, ah, Commercial Bank 2, your loan book blew up, yeah, whatever, just whatever, just keep the scoreboard the same. So then what would keep the but then what would happen, right? Is if they didn't have any cash flow coming in in the form of something that was outside of their control or the ability to access that, then all their clients could come in and say, Hey, we want our cash, paper currency. And then they'd have a problem, right? Because it, between the two banks, who cares? It does, I owe you this, you, you owe me this, but all it is is electronic digits. So let's just pretend that you didn't go bust. Let's just pretend that all your loans are still good. Because what? think about it, and I, I know it's hard to, to get your head around, but if, if all commercial bank, uh, if all the loans for commercial bank twos went, uh, blew up, they weren't getting paid, how would that affect commercial bank one? How would that affect the ledger? It doesn't. It's still the same because all the ledger is as a, a scoreboard. You see? So then Charlie comes in and wants to get his, uh, let's say, uh, 100000 but commercial bank doesn't have it because all they have are the electronic digits and they don't have access to the paper currency because then that's going to the central bank. So now they'd have a problem. Everyone would know they're insolvent and then they would go bust. They'd be bankrupt and then there'd be a big run on the bank. But what if you ban cash? What if Charlie can't get the paper dollars or the paper euros or what, what, what if the, that doesn't even exist? That's my point. Well, then the only thing that would exist is the ghost ledger and the scoreboard. And if the only thing that exists is the ghost ledger and the scoreboard, and there, then the only thing that exists is the, the wink, wink, and nod, nod, the relationship between bank one and bank two. And even if bank two's loan book blows up, if bank one doesn't acknowledge that they're bust, they're not bust. They keep doing business like nothing ever happened. That's another reason why I think they'll ban cash. Because <laughs> it eliminates the need to have an IOU that is outside of the control of the banking system. Or let me put that a different way. That's Another reason why I think the commercial banks will be incentivized to assist 
the central bank in banning cash. But on the other hand, maybe that would be an incentive for the central bank not to ban cash. It's an interesting dynamic there, isn't it? Especially when you consider the fact that the commercial banks themselves, at least in the United States, own the central bank. So how does that dynamic play out? A lot of interesting things to mull over, to say the least. All right. So I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. We got 350 people on the the live stream. Uh, that, that's quite a, a bit for a, an hour long live stream on um, the banking system that was incredibly esoteric <laughs> and very kind of uh, deep in the weeds. But I think it's important that we uh, really explore that and understand how the system works. And, uh, you know, the, the better we can understand the system, the better we can attach and think through the probabilities of what may happen in the future with money itself. And the only way that we can make good financial decisions, which is why we're doing this at the end of the day, to increase our personal freedom and liberty. That's what this is all about. It's all about freedom. And the more money you have, the more freedom you have. It doesn't make you happy, but it gives you more freedom. But in order to maintain your purchasing power or increase it, you need to make good decisions. And in order to make good decisions, you need to come, you need to determine probabilities. And in order to determine probabilities, you need to understand the system. And you cannot understand the system unless you understand money. And you can't understand money unless you understand what we just talked about. So uh, let me do some shout outs here. You can you guys can probably tell my voice is, is uh, strained to say the least. <laughs> so uh, we've got Angelique in the house. Thanks for hanging out, Angelique. We've got Rolling Paradise RV Rental. Oh, cool. That's a new, I haven't seen that uh, user here before, I don't think. Joaquin Cortada RR. Sustainable Lumber Company, Moody the Millennial, Bull Dog, The Angriest Puppy, uh, Fat Vegan, <laughs> P-H-A-T, <laughs> Ann Tran, Wayne Smith, Tacticus 1979, Todd Smitherman, Russ Parker, Denny Bloom, Ben Kuhn, FNS, Damian Ozawi. Uh, who else do we have here? Uh, Ralph Martinez. <clears throat> Wayne Smith, WB, Ribo Man, Captain Denny, Alex Z, Josh Seven. All right, guys, I think my voice is pretty much done. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me this evening, and I will see you on the next video.